It was uh, the month of May in 1933. I know that's like 40 years earlier than we've been looking back this year, 40 years before this faith community that we call MCC Toronto had come to be, but back in the late spring of 1933, the Maple Leafs had just, were fresh off a Stanley Cup final loss to the New York Rangers. It happened right over here in what used to be the Maple Leaf Gardens. Toronto's future mayor, uh, Mel Lastman, was an infant, a newborn. Unemployment was really high and people were struggling because of the Great Depression. It was a different world in a lot of ways, but there's a good chance that you know someone who lived in that world, parents, grandparents, elderly friends, relatives. Well, and I have a picture of this. It was in May of 1933 that supporters of the Nazi party in Germany looted libraries and other collections of books, made a giant pile of, of books in the streets of Berlin and set fire to some 20,000 volumes. I think this is on a slide, y'all. It was the biggest of the Nazi book burnings. You've probably heard about it before. Maybe you've seen this picture that was taken at the time. But what do you know about those books? Let's pray together. Blessed are you, eternal one, our God, ruler of time and space, who's kept us alive and sustained us and helped us to arrive in this moment. Amen. I'll ask again, what do you know about those books? Where did they come from? Who owned them? What were they about? Well, most of those books belong to a medical doctor by the name of Magnus Hirschfeld. Hirschfeld was Jewish, which the Nazis hated. He was also gay, which the Nazis hated too. But it was the type of medicine that Hirschfeld practiced that so outraged the Nazis, they decided to raid his extensive medical library and set fire to it. Because you see, Hirschfeld had opened a sexual health clinic back in 1919, and we would call it the world's first gender clinic. The clinic was a place where gay men could receive compassionate and supportive counsel, grounded in what was at the time a radical notion that being gay was both perfectly natural and perfectly okay. Actually, I actually have a slide with some folks from the Hirschfeld Clinic. It was a play, it looks, this is at a costume party. Hirschfeld is the one almost all the way to the right with the big mustache and the glasses. And he's holding hands with uh, Carl, his partner. His clinic was a place where trans women could receive gender-affirming care, including hormone replacement therapy and some of the world's first gender reassignment surgery. Hirschfeld actually had four trans women working in his clinic in the 1920s because it was hard for them to find work elsewhere. Situated in a plush Berlin villa, Hirschfeld's clinic was described as being full of life everywhere. It was a place of research, teaching, healing, and refuge. It was one of those special places where queer people could just exist as themselves without trouble. Hirschfeld wrote of a German soldier who we would today probably call a trans woman. And when that soldier was given the freedom at Hirschfeld's clinic to present as a woman to wear clothing on the outside that matched who she was on the inside, she wrote that it was her chance to be a human being at least for a moment. It was a beautiful thing. And it existed, it thrived, all the way back in the 1920s and 30s. We might have, just a few years ago, celebrated the 100th anniversary of this, the world's first clinic for gender-affirming care and sexual health, if it weren't for the rise of fascism. The Nazis were so threatened by anyone who was different, including any human expression that wasn't cisgender and heterosexual, that they destroyed Hirschfeld's clinic. They burned what at the time we would have called the world's foremost library of two SLGBTQ plus publications, many of them rare and irreplaceable. Hirschfeld fled the country, tried to reopen a practice in France, it fell to the Nazis, he fled further, and a few years later um, died of a stroke. Many of his patients, and so many folks like them, were sent to concentration camps. 
Now, despite claims that trans people represent some sort of new fad, we have always existed. Queer people of every variety have always existed. In fact, and I have another slide, I just recently learned that Canada's fourth governor general, the Marcus of Lorne, handsome fella, the namesake of the Lorne Park, in, uh, the Lorne Park neighborhood in Mississauga and my former church, founder of the National Gallery of Canada, son-in-law of Queen Victoria, was so famously bisexual, his wife, Princess Louise, had his bedroom window at Kensington Palace bricked up so he would st stop sneaking out at night to hook up with soldiers. <laughs> I shared this factoid with one of my friends and he said, well, she seriously underestimated the power of bisexuals. <clears throat> we have always existed. We have a long and rich and powerful history, beloved. But just as surely as we have always existed, we have always had to fight for our existence. We have had to struggle to create and curate and preserve records of our existence. We have had to battle against those who would destroy us and blot out any recorded evidence that we had been in this world. Not only is our existence powerful, our history is powerful. It's something that we must preserve just as deliberately and just as faithfully as the administration of King Josiah sought to preserve the scroll of the law that was found stashed away in some forgotten corner of the temple in the passage I read from 2 Kings. Who knows what pieces of his people's history might have wound up forgotten had the high priest and the king's administrator not happened upon that scroll, had they not read it out loud and savored the words and took those stories to heart. Our history is powerful. In preserving our history, we do the work of writing it on our hearts, writing it in our minds, just as the Holy Spirit envisions in the book of Hebrews, our New Testament lesson for the day. And it's not just our hearts and minds, friends. Preserving our history ensures that the powerful stories of our existence through the ages can be written upon our hearts and minds of those to come. I'm in love with history, y'all. It, it, is, it is such a wonderful thing. I found such comfort in those voices from the past that tell me who I am and remind me that I am not alone. We all stand in a deep stream. We are all surrounded by what our sacred story calls a great cloud of witnesses. And history has the power to turn those witnesses into our companions. Now, when the Southern Baptist Convention says that woman, women can't be pastors, like they said a couple days ago, kind of who cares, but whatever. I am comforted by the memory of Jenny Johnson, a black woman who was ordained to pastoral ministry by Baptist on the Michigan-Ontario border in 1919, 104 years ago. And I'm comforted by the story of Muriel Spurgeon Carter, ordained to pastoral ministry by Baptist here in Ontario back in 1946. Reverend Carter died in faith last Wednesday, June 14th a couple of months shy of her 101st birthday. She was a force to be reckoned with. When somebody tells me that they don't believe a trans woman can be a pastor, I take heart in the memory of Reverend Nancy Ledens. Nancy was a Roman Catholic priest before she transitioned back in the late 1970s. Her story drew international headlines and lots of hate. I was told that on one occasion, someone tried to kill her by firebombing her car. Nancy never served in the Catholic context again after she came out, but back in the 1990s, she became an active member of the Wedgwood Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. That's right, down in the south, about an hour from my hometown. Nancy died in faith in 2017, less than a year before I became self-accepting. So I never got to know her, but I've gotten to know some of Nancy's friends, and they tell me she gave beautiful benedictions and that when she preached about the resurrection, her words were really powerful. History helps us to understand who we are. Now there are hateful people in the world that don't want that, people who want to destroy our history. Now we're celebrating 50 years of history 
here in 2023 at MCC Toronto. 50 years ago, next month, a group of courageous souls gathered in the office of a gay bar to bring a metropolitan community church congregation to Toronto. We owe so much to those visionary people, our siblings who gathered back in 1973. You know, another queer organization that's turning 50 this year is the Canadian Gay uh, Liberation Movement Archives, uh, today known as the Archives with a Q, um, or Canada's LGBTQ plus archives. The archives have been helping us gather and preserve our own history in this anniversary year. We took a bunch of stuff over to, to their building near the village. They began as a project of the body politic, which actually this is a story that ran in the body politic in 1973. That's a cover of maybe the first body politic. Some of you probably remember reading that magazine. That's one of their covers. And, and like I said, the slide before shows the headline that they ran when our church opened. Uh, and if you wanna go back to that for just a sec, I think it's amazing that the news of MCC Toronto opening shares a page with a story about a gay bar being raided by police in Vancouver. It tells the story of, of the world that we were called to be in. Their work has helped me understand not only our history here at MCC Toronto, but where our church fits within the larger context of Canada's queer history. And in reading about the history of Canada's queer archives, I learned that back on Friday, December the 30th, 1977, Metropolitan and Provincial Police Forces raided and ransacked the queer archives, then located just north of Queen, I mean King and Adelaide. Much of what the police raided from the archives was lost or destroyed. Just like Hirschfeld's books back in 1933, but without the bonfire. It happened here in Toronto. And the raids sparked such international outrage and protest. I read that Harvey Milk himself led a demonstration at the Canadian consulate in San Francisco. Our history is powerful, so powerful that people want to destroy our history. Our stories matter so much. They bear such a crucial witness to our past and present existence that those stories themselves have often been threatened with destruction, but we survive, we persist, and with us persist our stories. Despite efforts of those who insist that people shouldn't say gay, or those who want to send us back into closets, or those who want to prevent others from even hearing about the existence of trans people, we keep on existing. We keep on writing our stories. We keep on preserving our stories. And we keep on telling our stories. Each of us today is writing a story, is creating a record of a remarkable life and a remarkable movement that has changed Toronto and changed the world. As we celebrate this month, as we celebrate this year, as we look back and remember where we've come from and where we're going, Let's hold tight to that history. Let's tell the stories and preserve the stories because they matter. Amen? Amen. Amen.